Welcome back to week six. This segment focuses on the standard and the legal and judicial measures that ought to be taken to protect journalists against violence. In the previous segment, I presented an overview of the violence against media communicators and defenders and some of the causes. I also highlighted the fact that journalists have been taking measures to strengthen their own self-protection. In this segment, I will focus on the international and national responses to violence against journalists. Journalists are vehicles for and of information, and thus they are indispensable to the enjoyment of freedom of expression and opinions. We have highlighted that consideration before. The importance of combating violence against journalists is highlighted in international and regional law as well as the jurisprudence attached to it. In the words of the UN Special Rapporteur on the protection and promotion of the right to freedom of opinion and expression, and I quote here, an attack against a journalist is not only a violation of his or her right to impart information, but also undermines the right of individuals and society at large to seek and receive information. Indeed, without respect for freedom of expression, and in particular freedom of the press, an informed, active and engaged citizenry is impossible. An attack against a journalist is therefore an attack against the principles of transparency and accountability as well as the right to hold opinions and to participate in public debates which are essential for democracy." End of quote. In 2011, the international expert nominated by the United Nations, the Organizations for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, the Organization of uh, American State, and the African Commission on Humans and People's Rights, came together to issue a joint declaration on crimes against freedom of expression. Those uh, crimes were actually violence against journalists and human rights defenders and others who are being targeted for speaking out. According to the joint declaration, states are under not only a so-called negative obligation to refrain from violating um, human rights and freedom of expression, but they are also under a positive obligation to ensure that the right is enjoyed by all. This entails a duty to provide sufficient protection from violent attacks, including violent attacks to media workers. The 2011 joint statement, which is based on a review of international law and international standards, highlight the fact that states should take adequate measures to end the climate of impunity and to prevent attacks on journalists and others exercising their right to freedom of expression, and that states are under a duty to investigate such attack. These protections do not just extend to journalists working in time and places of peace, but also to those working in conflict setting. Although under a conflict setting, the international standard will be, uh, will be different. At international level, the United Nations Security Council has adopted a number of resolutions condemning violence against journalists in the context of conflict and asking for appropriate measures to be taken to prevent such violence. For instance, uh, the resolution 1738 condemns all attacks and violence against media professionals in conflict situation. Very uh, recently, last year, the Security Council adopted resolution 2222, which recognized the important role that journalists play in conflict prevention by identifying early symptoms of violence and call for their protection. The resolution stress that all international humanitarian and human rights law protecting civilians during conflict apply to journalists as well. The resolution stress the primary responsibility 
of states in safeguarding the right of free expression online as well as offline. And it encouraged the United Nations and regional organizations to strengthen coordination on the protection of journalists. So these are some of the um, positions taken at the highest level of the United Nations to uh, condemn the attack against journalists and call for appropriate response. At the level of court, uh, global jurisprudence as well has also uh, equated violence against journalists to a crime against freedom of expression. And I'm going to cite a few of those cases. In the case of Nikema versus the Republic of Burkina Faso, the African Court for Human Rights ruled that the slaying of a journalist and the state's failure to investigate and penalize the attackers violated freedom of expression standard, in part because it instilled fear in other reporters. In the case of Vélez Restrepo and Family versus Colombia, the Inter-American Court for Human Rights also upheld the idea that attacks on journalists have a broad negative impact on freedom of expression and on other journalists who might become intimidated and fearful of violence for covering certain issues. The Declaration on Human Rights Defenders is also a, a very good a demonstration of a collective effort by the international community to address issues concerning defenders. It emphasizes that there is a global human rights movement that involves us all, and it stresses the state's positive obligations to protect human rights defenders from violence and threats. Let me turn more specifically to some of the um, human rights claim that can be highlighted in the case of violence against defenders and journalists. The right to life uh, is a, an evident one. In addition to the protection under Article 19 of the International Covenant, journalists and defenders are also protected under Article 6 of the ICCPR, which guarantee the right to life. These requirements apply to everyone, but they assume a particular importance in the case of journalists and other media workers, because the issue at stake is not merely the individual rights of those concerned, but the freedom of the media in general, and prevention of the chilling effect on freedom of expression and information of the victims uh, is, is uh, of tantamount importance. Article 6 of the ICCPR states that every human being has the inherent right to life. This right shall be uh, provided by law. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his or her life. The right to life is also, of course, reflected in the regional human rights convention. The protection from torture, inhuman or Degrading treatment is also a human right that applies directly to cases of journalists or defenders that are being targeted. The uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression was explicit in stating that journalists enjoy the freedom from torture, inhuman or degrading treatment, as affirmed in Article 7 of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, and which prohibits all individuals from being subjected to torture or to uh, ill treatment. In 1987, the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment, the CAT, was adopted, and the CAT imposes an absolute prohibition on torture and it mandates states to take effective judicial measures to prevent it. In uh, the uh, Americas, the organizations of American state has adopted the Inter-American Convention to prevent and punish torture, and it did that in 1985. The protection against torture is particularly well enshrined in international human rights law, because it is served by a convention, but also a range of institutions that are there to ensure that the convention is implemented. 
There have been a number of cases uh, related to the torture of journalists that have been reviewed by, by the international jurisprudence. Let me give you just one example. In uh, uh, Philip Afuson Najuru versus Cameroon, the United Nations Human Rights Committee held that if an act of torture is proven and a relationship between the treatment against a person and his activity as a journalist is established, there raises a violation of the person's freedom of expression and thus Article 19 of the ICCPR. Here what is interesting is that the court has not only ruled against uh, torture but also has linked torture with the right to uh, freedom of expression and has uh, described torture as a direct impediment to the realization of the right to freedom of expression. The, um, the most important aspect uh, in the violence against journalists beside prevention is impunity. And human rights organizations are spending equal times fighting on both fronts, trying to prevent the act of violence, including by insisting on stronger security measures and fighting impunity. Um, impunity for violence against journalists runs very high according to the impunity index published by the Committee to Protect Journalists, that impunity is closed to 100%, which means that almost no cases of violence against journalists result in an actual indictment of those that have uh, perpetrated their crimes and them uh, being punished for that crimes. Things are starting to change largely because of the work of international uh, press organizations and national human rights organizations that are on the front line of combating impunity. I'm going to illustrate this with a case from the European Court. Uh, Miroslava Gongadze was a political journalist and editor-in-chief of a, a newspaper in, in Ukraine, Ukrainska Pravda, and it was also an internet publication. He reported on human rights violations and corruption in Ukraine, and on September 16, 2000, he disappeared. Months prior to his disappearance, he had contacted the authorities and communicated about threat on his life and surveillance. The authorities reported that there was no need to issue a protective order on Mr. Gongadze. On November 2, 2000, a decapitated body of an unknown person was discovered in the vicinity of a regional town. And a few weeks later, the body was identified as that of the journalist, Mr. Gongadze. For over a year, there have been delays with the investigation, claims that the murder has been resolved, but eventually several persons were convicted of the murder, four of whom were government officials. The European Court ruled that the essential purpose of an investigation is to ensure the accountability of parties responsible for a crime. The court accepted that there may be obstacles or difficulties which prevent progress in an investigation in a particular situation. However, a prompt response by the authorities in investigating the use of lethal force or a disappearance may generally be regarded as essential in ensuring public confidence in their maintenance of the rule of law and in preventing any appearance of collusion in or tolerance of unlawful act. Looking at the fact, the European Court held that the state had unduly delayed the investigations and were more preoccupied with proving the lack of involvement of high-level state officials rather than discovering the truth. It took almost four years to conduct the investigation, during which Mr. Gongadze's wife also could not seek financial compensation since there was no conviction. Thus, the European Court 
held that the state had not conducted an effective investigation and thus denying a remedy to the wife of Mr. Gongadze. I'm quoting here from the decision of the court. A state's refusal to conduct a full investigation of the murder of a journalist is particularly serious because of its impact on society. And that is the case here because the impunity of any of the parties responsible for an act of aggression against a reporter constitute an incentive for all violators of human rights. At the same time, the murder of a journalist has a chilling effect, most notably on other journalists, but also on ordinary citizens, as it instills the fear of denouncing any and all kind of offenses, abuses or illegal act. End of quote. The UN Special Rapporteur on the Protection of Freedom of Expression declared, and I quote, impunity is a root cause for the lack of safety faced by journalists, and it is one, if not the main cause, of the unacceptably high number of journalists who are attacked or killed every year. In 2015, as I have mentioned earlier, the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 2020, in which it stated that impunity significantly undermines the protection of journalists against violence, and it strongly condemned the prevailing impunity for violations and abuses committed against journalists, media professionals, and associated personnel in situation of armed conflict, which in turn may contribute to the recurrence of this act. The resolution was here uh, focusing on armed conflict. Resolution 2020 focused on, uh, on armed conflict, but um, there has been other measures by the United Nations, including Security Council or General Assembly, lamenting the, the impunity for crimes against journalists. This led to the adoption last year of Resolution 68163, on the safety of journalists, uh, and it includes the establishment of an international day to end impunity for crimes against journalists, and it urged member states to ensure accountability to bring the perpetrators of crimes against journalists to justice. Still, ultimately, the best response remains, of course, prevention and protection. Hence, the importance of all the various mechanisms developed by and implemented by journalists, press freedom organizations, and employers. Protection also entails digital security against hacking and surveillance, but also the mental health, not just physical, of, of the journalist. Journalists who investigate violence or who have been subject of, of threats of act of violence need to take measures to protect their mental health. Again, you will find additional information in the um, uh, additional video that you, can, that you can consult. To sum up, global freedom of expression entails the protection of journalists and human rights defenders against act of violence committed by state or non-state actors. There are a range of international and regional provisions supported by jurisprudence which insist on the obligations placed upon state to prevent acts of violence, offer means of protection, and investigate swiftly acts of violence. At international level, the international community has adopted a number of resolutions to denounce acts of violence and calls for measures to respond to such acts of violence and indeed to prevent them. As I have highlighted throughout the last two segments, uh, self-help, self-protection by journalists, human rights defenders, their friends and colleagues and their employers to my mind, remains so far the main um, wall that protect them against acts of violence. This has demanded far, far greater awareness about the violence, far greater awareness about the risk factors, and far greater understanding of what can be done to protect themselves against becoming the target of acts of violence without 
self-censorship and without silencing um, their, their work and their words. To return to the um, previous segment and this beautiful quote from the Colombian journalist to ensure that their words can continue to spread and denounce the abuse of power by too many and denounce the violence against uh, the most vulnerable members of our societies.